Alright, what's up guys? My name is Zach and today I am driving a 1992 Nissan Toronto. Up front is a 2.7 liter turbocharged inline diesel four cylinder and down below is a five speed manual transmission. Now I'm super excited to be driving this here Toronto for two reasons. First of all, it's always fun to be driving something from Japan. I'm driving on the right side of the car while still being in Illinois, which is in the United States, where we drive on the left. So it's always a fun little treat to drive right-hand drive. But the second reason I'm really excited is because last fall, I actually drove a Datsun diesel pickup, which was based off of this car. It shares a chassis. And so I'm excited to compare and contrast that truck with this SUV. That review will be found at the end of the video. But before we get on with the rest of the video, if you are interested in helping out the channel, there are some links in the description below for some products that go towards helping the channel. There is a suction cup license plate from Con Plates. There is a fixed OBD2 Bluetooth sensor to help diagnose your car issues. And there is cash for cars that helps you sell your vehicle quickly. Again, if you'd like to help out the channel, please click the links in the description below. Let's get on with the video. Before we get into anything, I do want to talk about the name and the platform. This is a Nissan Toronto, which here in the United States, we got as the Nissan Pathfinder. Of course, we got it in left-hand drive and we didn't get the range of engines that this vehicle got. But if you're looking at it and you're like, hey, that just looks like a Pathfinder, it is. Uh, it is just a Pathfinder. And it shares a platform with the Nissan hard body pickup truck, so it's stout, it's body on frame and it's reliable. But let's get back to that diesel under the hood. The 2.7 liter was not the biggest engine offered here in the Tirano. You could get a three liter V6 shared with the Nissan Z cars. And that's important because as we talk about this car, this car has a lot of nice features, features that wouldn't be standard on other vehicles. And the reason for that is because of the larger displacement engines. The larger the displacement over in Japan, the more you pay in taxes and fees. So because this car had bigger engines, it ended up being a lot more expensive. And because it was more expensive, Nissan felt like in order to give people their money's worth, they had to add more features. So because of the bigger engine, you actually get power windows and ice cold AC, which we'll talk about later on. Now, this engine was never sold here in the US in a Nissan. However, we did get it in very small numbers in a forklift. So if you plan on buying one of these and you need some parts, you might want to throw away the Nissan catalog and pick up a forklift catalog. If I can find horsepower and torque, I'll put it up on the screen. This car is incredibly, incredibly slow, almost worryingly so. However, that's not really the point of getting a diesel. Obviously, it's not a high revving engine. It revs just above 4,000 RPM, but this car has the grunt to do what you need it to do. And again, it wasn't made for the American market. So most countries don't have the wide open Wyoming, Nevada, Utah roads that reward horsepower, fast speeds. Japan doesn't have many straight long roads, so you're not really getting up to any big speeds. So it doesn't really matter. Like I said, paired to it, five speed manual transmission. One thing about the transmission is that it is geared very short. You are one, two, three, pretty much immediately. Fourth is basically a cruising gear, and I don't think I ever even got up into fifth unless I am on the highway or something of the sort. One, two, and three are really, really close together. However, the actual shifter feels fantastic, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the interior. Last but not least, this here Toronto is four-wheel drive. So let's talk about the interior. We have some interesting 90s Japanese quirky things to talk about. Well, in front of me, I have four main gauges. On the left is my speedometer. Then I have my fuel and coolant temperature in the middle. And then I have my tachometer off to the right. Nothing really too special there. However, very stereotypical of Nissan in the 90s. Down below that, I have some warning lights, especially for my fuel and my glow plugs down to the left. Those are diesel specific. And my hazard down below that, then I do actually have a choke, which you don't really see much of post really the 1980s. My 85 RX-7 has a choke, but you don't really see that much after that time period. So 1992, kind of late to have that. I do also have wipers down there. And then to the right of the steering wheel and gauge cluster, I have my rear defroster and my rear hatch release, which is pretty nice. 
on the steering wheel, I don't get anything except for the fact that it says Nissan. It's off center. I don't know why they did this. Even the horn button is off center. Pretty unusual and I really don't see a reason for it, but that's how they made it. To the right of me on the door, we have our power locks and power windows. Pretty standard stuff here. However, in 92, it wasn't as standard. And like I said, these are some of the nicer features that the Tirano got. One thing I wanted to point out is up here, there is this sunshade, but I've never seen a sunshade quite like this. You actually unscrew it here, and then you just kind of pull it off. And now the sunroof is a sunroof. You have these sort of dots that don't make it super bright, but it's also not tint. But I've never seen it where you pull and then have to unscrew things just for the cover of the sunroof. Very, very interesting. Moving into the center, this is the most quirky and cool piece of the Tirano in my opinion, and something that I also saw in the Nissan Datsun diesel pickup. I have pitch, roll, and altitude. It says clinometer or clinometer, however you want to say it, and altimeter for four wheel drive. Now, these are super gimmicky, not super useful in day to day life, but if you plan to take it off roading, you can tell the pitch and roll of the truck from these gauges, which is really, really cool. Down below that, we have two climate control vents. And something I want to point out here is that these are pretty worn, pretty used, and abused. This isn't uncharacteristic of Japanese domestic vehicles from this era. Even though this truck only has 47,000 kilometers, roughly about 28,000 miles, these look like they've definitely seen better days. That's just kind of par for the course when it comes to vehicles of this age, from this era, from this region of the world. However, if you are going to buy one of these in America, finding these dash plates is not going to be the easiest thing in the world. That's where you're gonna to start to run into issues finding parts. Engine parts usually aren't too bad to find for Japanese domestic vehicles. It's the interior parts that will really end up biting you. Then we have the climate control options. Like I said, I am pleasantly enjoying cold, cold AC, which is coming from an R12 system because Japan used R12 way longer than the US did. The US moved to 134 in the 90s Japan stuck with it. Very easy, basic climate controls. They look straight out of the 80s or 90s. They're really sort of timeless in the fact that they're very bland and basic. Down below that, I do have a little ashtray and cigarette lighter because it's a Japanese domestic vehicle and you gotta have those. And then of course, the radio has since been changed out because all radios from the 90s were pretty much garbage except for a handful, you know who I'm talking about. Then moving onto the floor, we have our floor mounted shifter and floor mounted four wheel drive settings. The shifter, like I said, feels great. The clutch is nice and light, super enjoyable to drive, super easy to drive. Now, once you get it into gear, you're not really gonna go anywhere or break any speed limits. And to be honest, I don't even know if I've achieved the speed limit yet in this video. <laughs> but the actual shifter itself feels super notchy, click, 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 right into place, and I love that. That's what I love about Japanese cars. But then I also have the floor-mounted four-wheel drive settings, which is super handy, and I love the fact that they're mechanical. Around this time, at least in America, we were starting to see push-button four-wheel drive settings, and honestly, just personally, I don't like that as much. Then moving on to the center console itself, we have the handbrake and two very cool buttons. So on the left, I have my suspension settings which is very unusual for an SUV like this. But again, that's some of those premium features that you got for paying the extra price. You can actually adjust the suspension between sport and touring. So touring is going to be a little bit comfier and sport obviously is going to be a little bit stiffer for cornering and things like that. And I do have to say, switching between the modes, I do feel a difference. Now, does it go from a plush Bentley feel to a hardcore track car? No, but there is enough difference to justify the button. The second fun feature, something that's really rare here in America, is the headlight washer feature. So at the click of the button, you can wash your headlights. This is mostly seen in European and Japanese cars. Never really caught on that much here in America. So it's always fun to play with that. Then I get a little cubby and finishing it out, I don't have any cup holders here in the Nissan Toronto, so it fails the big freaking bottle test. <laughs> Now we gotta talk about the seats. The seats are finished in this really nice 90s material. They're cloth 
and I absolutely love this. I wish that cars stuck with this plush material. It's warm, it's comfortable, it's soft, it's welcoming. And every Japanese car I've driven from Japan has some type of cloth like this and it's always been super comfortable. I always look forward to sitting in them. But speaking of seats, we do have back seats, so let's go do a back seat review. All right, so we're in the back of the 1992 Nissan Toronto R3M. Couple things to note back here. First of all, the first thing you notice is that the floor is pretty high up. This can be found in the same year like Toyota 4Runner, things like that. This sort of era of SUVs, having the high floor and low seats is kind of par for the course. They are stadium seats where these seats are actually higher than the driver seat so you can kind of see up and over the front driver and passenger which is interesting and nice something also found in the nissan xterra that came a little bit later but a couple interesting things first of all this fabric found on the front seats is found everywhere back here even on the door cards i have power windows back here again a nice feature for 92 but the most interesting thing is that i have these armrests on the sides i actually have armrests on my outside arms which is very weird. I don't get a center armrest, but I get armrests on either side, which is very, very strange. I don't know if I've seen that in a car before. Very interesting. Let's go hop around back. We'll take a look at the trunk and cargo space, and then we'll talk about the looks. So opening up the tailgate is kind of a two-step process, and I'm gonna try to do it one-handed. First of all, you have this tire carrier on the back, and you actually have to pull out on this lever and then that unhitches it and this moves out like that actually it'll go pretty far i mean that's a pretty far opening which is pretty neat but then once that's open you can come up here and open the trunk like normal once inside the trunk nothing really to note here besides the fact that the second row of seats does fold down so if you need to fit a bunch of cargo back here you absolutely can you have this nice little speaker and things like that but other than that nothing really too crazy back here besides that opening tailgate and i do actually get opening glass which is something I love in 90s cars. Rear glass like this is kind of hard to find in modern cars, but I love this accessibility because if you have like a pet back here or things back here, you don't want to pull that tire rack all the way off to the side. You can just access the window, get in here, get in, get out, get your things and get on with your life. Super, super cool. And then like this, we just bring this over here. You see there's like a little clip. There we go. Nice, satisfying click. Now we gotta talk about the looks. And looking at it, this truck, this SUV, whatever you wanna call it, looks like a Nissan Pathfinder. And that's because it is. This is what the Nissan Pathfinder is called around the globe, is the Toronto. In Japan, there is no Pathfinder. There's only the Toronto. And so obviously, it looks a lot like a Pathfinder, which I like its boxy, simple shape. I think it's presentable, I think it's handsome, and I do love this color. I always thought this car was black when I was talking to the owner, but actually upon further inspection, it is in fact blue. And so let's get to my final thoughts here on the Nissan Toronto. What do I think? What's so special about this car? Well, the only downside I can really find is the fact that this thing is slow. It is so incredibly slow that sometimes I feel like I might be endangering traffic ever so slightly. But besides that, it's so fun to be driving something so different and unique and something that we never got here in the United States. Of course, we got Pathfinders. Biggie Smalls was rapping about them way back in the day. But we never got them in diesel. We didn't get them in right-hand drive. We didn't get the R3M package. We didn't get all of this stuff. And so if you wanted a luxury SUV in the 90s in Japan, this is what you were looking at. Maybe not the diesel. Maybe you get the VG engine. But these were the features that you were dealt. This is the driving experience you had. And it's just so cool to be able to experience these other cultures without leaving my home country without having to buy an expensive plane ticket, without having to figure out a new language. And I'm so thankful that I was able to drive this and the Datsun Diesel last fall so I could really get a perspective on this platform. And so I have Jimmy to thank for that. Thank you so much, Jimmy, for letting me take out your Nissan Toronto. This thing is an absolute treat. It's always fun to see how the other side lives, you know, to get to experience vehicles that weren't ever meant to be even sold here. The fact that I'm driving this car around a suburban neighborhood in Northern Illinois, <laughs> it, 
I don't think the original designer ever dreamed of that or even thought of that happening. So that's very, very cool and unique. So like I said, a huge thank you to Jimmy for letting this review happen. You can follow his Instagram linked in the description below. But I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Don't forget to rate the video, comment on the video, and subscribe if you really liked it. Take care, guys.